It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ralph Nyland. Dr. Nyland is the Distinguished Service Professor in Civil Culture and Forest Management at State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse, New York. Dr. Nyland has a Bachelor's in Forestry from Syracuse University and a PhD in Civil Culture and Forest Management from Michigan State University. And he has uh, published numerous technical articles and a recent book entitled Silviculture Concepts and Applications. Anytime there's a discussion of forestry in the eastern U.S., it seems like the question comes up, what can we do about high-graded hardwood stands in the eastern U.S.? It's a complex and persistent problem, and Dr. Nyland has spent considerable part of his career working on this issue, and we look forward to hearing to his uh, innovative approaches to this issue. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Nyland. Thank you, Tom. Let's start with some basic definitions, and my thought here is that uh, if we have a common understanding of what the words are and what the techniques mean, then when we talk about the effects of rehabilitation, it may be more meaningful. So, so the definitions will deal with forests, their management, and their use. And the place to start then is with forestry itself. I'd like you to focus on three words here. Science, art, common sense. Well, common sense is two words. But forestry really draws upon a body of theory that helps us to appreciate what happens in forests and how our efforts change those dynamics but we, we have to use judgment to pull together different possible techniques to come up with the right one that satisfies our owner's interest. And that takes a lot of common sense to figure out to, how to do it efficiently and effectively. Above all, we want to sustain those values. So forestry must, must take a long-term perspective on life. As a subset of forestry, uh, we have the discipline of forest management. And you notice uh, art and science comes back here again. When we move to forest management, we're, we're trying to take a bundle of objectives that a landowner might have and figure out how we can satisfy those objectives while still maintaining, maintaining productivity over the long term. And productivity means more than just timber growth. It means productivity for habitat, uh, visual qualities, water yields, and all of those kinds of things. Again, to sustain those values over long periods of time. And then silviculture, the discipline I work with, is a part of forestry that works at controlling the establishment, the growth, composition, and quality of forests. Now, by, by controlling, I don't mean subdue but rather that through the methods of silviculture, we try to influence the way stands grow and develop so that they are sustained through time and provide the benefits over the long term. Beginning back in the uh, late 80s and well in through the 90s, uh, forestry began to focus on a new idea or a new to us idea called ecosystem management. Some people today think of it as sustainable forestry, but notice the, the effect here is creating, maintaining, and reestablishing desirable ecosystem conditions. So, so the whole focus here is back onto the ecosystem, and we'll use stand-level treatments to bring that about. So when you hear comments about operating landscape scales, we have to do that one stand at a time. When, when we even think about operating at the forest level, we must do that one stand at a time, and that is the role of silviculture. Now, as an aftermath of doing these things, desiring, uh, sustaining these desirable systems, we will inevitably derive values. And part of the values will be commodities or uses, but the main focus is creating, maintaining, and establishing those desirable conditions. Okay, so silviculture focuses on the stands and the methods we use to manage individual stands and the stand by definition, is that part of a forest that we treat by some management activity, including a timber sale. It's the area we operate as a single entry, and it is also the unit of record keeping for the forest. Silviculture really has only two purposes, and this is a very key point, that 
silviculture either regenerates a mature age class when it reaches some degree of maturity by definition of a landowner, or it tends intermediate age classes to nurture their growth and development towards some desired end. And, and this applies both to stands that have a single age class in them and the multiple age classes. So where does timber harvesting fit in? Well, we use timber harvesting and tree cutting, really, as a means to accomplish these silvicultural purposes. So if we are tending, if we're properly regenerating, there will be excess trees to remove, and those trees we can put into the marketplace to generate revenues to help pay the costs of management and ownership. So let's consider silviculture. Uh, I like to envision silviculture as a big tool bag of, of techniques and methods and approaches that we can use to sustain the values of interest. And those values would involve the ways we regenerate and the way we tend stands to serve those landowner interests. We can't practice silviculture without first understanding what the landowner wants long term and then we can figure out how to go about doing that. Recently, I've been involved with a, a group from uh, Quebec and Maine Forest Service, the province of Quebec, uh, the Canadian Forest Service. We've been trying to think about the alternatives of civil culture and how they might break down into, into different kinds of broad pathways. And, and one of them we define as restoring, returning things to, a, to an original state. Uh, Kathleen LaRouche in, in this discussion uh, raised the idea that if you bought an old house and wanted to uh, redo it so it was just like back in the 1700s, you would take out the plumbing, you'd take out the heating system, you'd remove the electric lights, you'd do all those things, and you would restore it to that original state so you could experience things as they originally occurred. That would be restoration. Most of what we do in civil culture we call refining, trying to improve on and sustain existing conditions, improving to, to move stands towards a, a more perfect condition relative to the objectives of the owner and that are ecologically sustainable through time. And the third part of it would be rehabilitating, that through some past use, some past activity or disturbance, functionality essentially has been lost from a stand, at least relative to the interests of an owner. And so rehabilitation treatments try to reestablish that lost functionality. Today we want to focus on rehabilitation and think about why we do it, what it would involve, and how we could go about implementing it. Through those discussions in Quebec, we, we struggled with a definition, and uh, you see on the screen one that we ended up with, at least for the present. So we want to use ecologically acceptable methods, and, and we want to reestablish whatever desirable conditions fit with the interest of a landowner after some kind of an uncontrolled disturbance. Again, the interest of the landowner defines what we will do, the direction we'll take, and what we try to accomplish. We believe that there are several uh, natural and people-caused disturbances that would set the stage for a rehabilitation treatment of some kind. So the effects of ice and snow loading and windstorms would be one. This has been a major concern for us in the northern area with, due to that 1998 ice storm that literally damaged thousands and thousands of acres from New York up through the St. Lawrence Valley and into uh, parts of New England. Uh, fire, not a, big, not a big natural disaster effect here in, in the moist, humid northeast, but, but certainly in eastern North America, there are places where, where fires cause uh, a lot of disturbance. Insect and diseases, uh, defoliating insects, such as the effect you see here of the uh, forced tent caterpillar. Uh, those things uh, bring change that, that proves unsatisfactory to landowners. And cutting practices. Uh, cutting practices go on forever. They never end. They always seem to come back and, and uh, they cause disturbance. So uh, if you think about diameter limit cutting, 
That's a very common disturbance. Diameter limit cutting simply means taking the big trees out and leaving the little trees behind. And we, we put it into a broad group of <coughs> practices called selective cutting, not selection cutting, but selective cutting. It is an undisturbed or an uncontrolled disturbance. <coughs> so let's use exploitive cutting to explore stand rehabilitation and, and what it might involve. Primarily, we'll focus on the effects of diameter limit cutting and how, how that has really disturbed the functionality, the composition, and the structure of forest stands. <coughs> Excuse my cough, I've had a cold here. Well, let's ask how much diameter limit cutting uh, we find out there compared to silviculture. And what does it leave behind compared to civil culture? Back in the 90s, the New York Society of American Foresters wanted to find out what actually was happening across New York State based on a concern that disruptive cutting was becoming more widespread. So it, it decided to sample randomly chosen stands and look at the five characteristics of the residual. The, the residual stocking measured in basal area per acre. The variation in that residual stocking, particularly compared to what had been present based upon a pre-cut uh, estimate. Whether the cutting left behind desirable species, did it change the average diameter by reducing it or increasing it? And what happened to the saw timber potential? We weren't just focusing on one of these elements, but put them together into a combination effect on the stand. And, and for that, we rated each of these elements as either good, mediocre, or bad, based upon some decision uh, criteria that had been developed in advance. Don't, don't try to study this. Uh, the important thing I want you to see here is that there were, there were six elements here that were evaluated. And in each of these, there were a fixed set of criteria that people use to uh, make a decision. And, and from that, we assigned points to each of these categories and, and ended up by averaging them to rate each stand on a scale of one to three. And we had it broken down by one-tenth increments. Here's the findings. Of the 63 stands that were randomly chosen and sampled, only about two out of uh, four less than that, 38 uh, percent, were considered good. These are stands that we would consider having been treated by civil culture or something similar to it, where production and other values could be sustained through time. There's a high potential here to sustain those values. There's a lot of opportunities for long-term production in these stands. The integrity for many other non-timber values seems to be assured and there's opportunities to manipulate for other values into the future. This may be the most frightening statistic that half of what we found were of questionable condition. They were not civil culture, but yet they were not ravaged. I call these stands mediocre and, and put them into a class of what I call civil cultural purgatory. There's some hope out here we might be able to rehabilitate these with creative thinking and good technique, but we've lost some of the values. In the last group, uh, only one in seven, about, were really poor. These are essentially lost stands. They're, they're ravaged, they're degraded and dismal, there's very little chance for the future. It's hard to imagine what one would do without in making major investments to completely recoup the whole nature of, of what's in the forest there. The rabbit stands commonly were the subject of at least two diameter limit cuts that, that took out the good stuff, left the bad stuff, and left the uh, un patchy, un uniform and distributed growing stuff. Well, that was a survey in New York. But, but there have been more recent surveys uh, here in New York again, in Pennsylvania, Kentucky, and West Virginia. Here, here's one by Pell questioned the potential for long-term sustainability of the stands that they found. Marianne Faven in West Virginia, all but a few of the 90 she surveyed were not sustainable. 
McGill in West Virginia, uh, diamond limit cutting was the most severe practice that they found out there. Monsell and Germain here in New York found, she found stands were mediocre and not sustainable. Schuler and McGill in the Appalachian region, that diamond limit cutting had depleted quality saw timber resources. Stringer in Kentucky, 72% of stands were degraded by exploitive cutting, and most recently, Monsell and, and the group here in New York said the diameter limit and premature cutting was pervasive across New York State. And that may, makes me raise the question, is this really forestry? Or is it simply the process of finding, putting a value on, and efficiently extracting saleable products from forested lands? If so, that is not forestry. My mentor called it the green lie, that it looks like a forest, it smells like a forest, it sounds like a forest, but it's just a pretense for the real thing, and quite a pretense for the values that we could sustain from forests through appropriate silviculture. The, the, to me, it's like closing the door after the sheep got out, where the value of the stand, the production potential, the potential to, to control habitat conditions and visual qualities and water yields and all of that has really been just lost, at least for, for long, long periods of time. We need to start by admitting that uh, we really don't have effective tools for evaluating what the ecologic impact has, has been from these kinds of exploitive harvests. It changes the forest, and we can speculate that what it might do, but to measure this is, is difficult. So I will not try to assess the effects in an ecologic sense. Rather, I'd like to, to look at how the cutting may change stand conditions and ask if the residual conditions dictate or limit the treatment options for the future. To do this effectively, we, we need to remind ourselves what are the differences between even uneven and two age stands, and to see if, if the age arrangement within the stand makes any difference in the way we approach it for the future. So let's define those things. Even age means that the community has only small differences in ages between the trees that are present. And there's a convention in forestry that the spread of ages would not exceed 20% of the rotation length. So rotation, that, that's the planned number of years from when the stand is formed after a disturbance or a regeneration method until it's the final cutting, which is the regeneration method, when the stand reaches a specified degree of maturity. So if a stand were 100 years old at maturity, the spread of ages would not be more than 20 years within that stand. These even age stands have a clear pattern of development. They start out with a lot of small trees, and as they mature through time, we have bigger trees, but natural mortality reduces the numbers present, and eventually they become bigger with even fewer trees and, and reach a point of maturity where we may want to regenerate or replace that stand one more time. And if we had a forest comprised of even age stands, they might be at different stages of development, but these conditions would occur in each one. So an even age forest has a collection of even age stands, each of them at different stages of development. So in even aged, then, all trees regenerated at the same time, or close to that, all developed to maturity together, all come of age together, and at some point we must remove the entire community as the regeneration method to establish a new even age stand in its replacement. The general civil culture here is that during the young stages of development, uh, we tend these stands. Remember, regeneration and tending are our two civil cultural practices. And, and our goal here is to reduce crowding and uh, to focus the growth potential on the trees that are have the characteristics best suited to the landowner's interests. And we do that by thinning. Thinning favors the best trees of upper canopy positions. Key here is not only does this provide you with the best values at the end of the rotation, but it also gives you the trees of the best characteristics to use as seed sources for the next rotation. Remember in forestry, we use the phenotype, the outward appearance of the tree, 
as an index to its genetic potential. So if during thinning we're nurturing the growth and development of phenotypically excellent trees, we get to the end of the rotation, we have them, we expect that will be a good seed source for the future. Tending, thinning influences the growth and development by focusing the growth potential on the trees that interest the landowner. And then when, when the stand reaches that stage of development that we call mature by whatever criteria, then it's time to regenerate them. And one of the techniques we use is called shelterwood method, as an example, where we keep those trees of ideal phenotypic characteristics at uniform spacing. We use them as seed source. We use them to help mitigate the change of environmental conditions near the ground. And when the new cohort has become established, we remove those seed trees and have a new even age stand in its place. Here you see an example of a shelterwood stand after the seed cutting, the widely spaced residuals, and the new cohort that has developed beneath them. That's even aged. Now, uneven age, the community has trees of markedly different ages, a wide spread of ages. And the convention here says that the spread of ages would exceed 25% of the lifespan for that age class. We don't have rotations with even a uneven age. We have lifespans of trees. So if I intended to grow an age class to 100 years, then the spread of ages within this uneven age stand would exceed 25 years. That's the convention. So each stand has trees of different ages, and they commonly have different sizes. Uh, the young trees are small in diameter and short in height. The middle-aged trees are medium-sized and medium diameters, etc. But they all grow together in the same stand so that we have this mixture of age classes in and across the space of the stand. And remember, only one age class reaches maturity at a time. <coughs> so our civil culture will remove that mature age class and concurrently tend the intermediate age classes. <coughs> so with, with even age stands, we would have this mixture throughout the whole stand. And with forests comprised of uneven age stands, we'd have this uneven age mixture across the whole forest. So the parts of each stand regenerate different times. Young, medium, old age trees present. Each comes of age at a different time. So the silviculture here is to remove the old stage class as the regeneration method, to tend the intermediate age classes, and we'll do this periodically, controlling, influencing growth and development, ensuring new age classes each time we enter the forest. Here's an example of selection system. This is the even, uneven aged regeneration method that opens space in this case, single tree spaces, to create environmental conditions conducive to regeneration of new trees. And when you couple it with uh, tending of the immature age classes, you end up with a stand where these different age classes are intermingled, and, and you have a sustainable system at the stand level. The third class of stands generally are two-aged where the stand has, as it says, two distinct age classes. Uh, by convention, the ages are separated by more than 20% of the lifespan for any one of them. So a, a typical two-age stand would have some older, bigger trees, usually at a wide spacing and with a younger cohort beneath them. And through time, we would remove the old trees when they reach a stage of maturity, leaving behind the intermediate age trees, and we would then regenerate a new cohort beneath them and start this whole process over. The entry time may, may be perhaps 50 year cycles here. And a, a regeneration cutting would look like this, with the widely spread residual trees and the new cohort forming beneath them. <clears throat> That's what the practice looks like, going from the condition on the left to the condition in the middle, which is only one age class left, regenerating a new age class and starting all over again. 
two distinct ages present, great differences in the age between the two cohorts. Each one comes of age at a different time. Now, let me tell you that in the study we did here in New York State, we did not find two age stands. They are not common. This is a, something that's been of interest in, in fairly recent times, but we just don't have them up here. Okay, there's some basic ideas about um, to start from, to build a platform that we can begin thinking about rehabilitation and the effects of cutting. So I'm going to pause here and, and let Tom see what questions we should address before going on. Tom? If you've got some questions for Dr. Nyland, you can type them into the uh, notes box that's on the right side of your screen. Um, while we're waiting to see if some questions appear, um, Dr. Nyland, what are some of the challenges to determining whether uh, a particular stand is even-aged or uneven-aged? What are some of the indicators that we look for to make that call? Good. That's a good question, uh, in, in the sense that it's pivotal to making a civil culture decision. In, in, in even-aged communities that have a shade-tolerant component or have trees of uh, different growth rates, you will often find trees of different diameters. Uh, in, in the ones where there's a shade tolerant component, though, uh, the trees will still be relatively tall for their diameter, but with small diameters. And the live crown ratios commonly will be oh, as small as uh, 10 or 15 percent in the smaller trees, and while the, the bigger trees may have a 25%, 30% live crown ratio. So a characteristic of an even age stand is that you have a uh, generally a uh, foliar layer, a crown layer, that's well elevated above the surface. There's usually very little green foliage beneath that main canopy layer, and the, the small trees have, are tall for their diameter and have a very small live crown ratio. In uneven age stands, the small trees are shorter, distinctly shorter, and the live crown ratios will be 40 to 60 percent in a managed stand. The medium sized trees will be medium heights, again with a 40 to 60 percent live crown ratio. So that if you look at an uneven age stand, you will see a, a distinct green wall, the visibility will be short. If you look at an even age stand, you can often see through it for miles. The complicator here are stratified species mixtures where the slower growing cohort, slower growing species will, will be at a shorter height, but because it's overtopped, still will tend to have a short life crown ratio. The, the bark characteristics of an even age stand at mid-rotation ages the small trees will look like old bark. In uneven age stands, the small trees will have young looking bark. Does, does that help? Yeah, that helps. Um, if you're good with tree ID, can you get a pretty good indication by the species that are present or not necessarily? No, because, uh, well, it, to some degree you can. In, in the sense that uneven age stands usually are dominated by the more shade tolerant species. The even age stands, at least uh, in the more northern half of your region, uh, would have a mixture of even and uneven aged. So if you do find uh, a high proportion of, of uh, shade and tolerant trees, there's a good chance that it's, it's probably even aged, except if it's been managed at low densities. Then then we can regenerate mid-tolerant species in uneven age stands and grow them up into the main canopy layers. We've got a couple of questions. The first one is from Rajan. I hope I said that name right. Um, can you please define once again selection cutting and selective cutting? Okay, good. That, that's, uh, that's key, too, to, as we move ahead. Selection cutting is, is the silvicultural method for we're dealing with uneven age stands, and it involves then removing the oldest mature age class of the regeneration method and tending the immature age classes so that you nurture their growth and development of the best trees. 
So it is, it is sustainable silviculture at the stand level. Selective cutting, by definition of the Society of American Foresters, means creaming, culling, hydrating, choice species removed without regard for sustained yield. So it, it's really an exploit of harvest. And diameter limit cutting fits into the category of selective cutting, because all you do is take out big trees and you don't do anything more. Hopefully that uh, speaks to the question. Another question from Zachary. What species are you managing for most in these uneven-aged stands? You know, in all silviculture, you really, you really manage for the ones that are best suited to the site. In, in our northern hardwoods, the principal species would be sugar maple. Uh, so you, you, you probably would be managing for the species that are best fitting the landowner objectives, as long as they've got a reasonable degree of shade tolerance. And, and if it was timber, you would look for the ones that have the highest timber value. If you have other objectives in mind, then you'd look for the species that would serve those long-term objectives. But, but generally, it will be the species that is best suited to the site you're working on. That's our last question. Um, I think, Dr. Nolan, you could uh, continue now. OK, let, let's go on then. And, and return to the uh, New York SAF timber harvesting evaluation and see what some characteristics showed up among the, the cutover stands. Uh, first off, we did not find that the cutting had just left poor species. It, it, had, it had removed from the even age stands the more shade and taller component. In our case, it would be species like white ash and black cherry. But sugar maple is part of those stands as well. And sugar maple for us is a very desirable species. Uh, you can see here the, the degree of shade tolerance, starting with the most shade tolerant for us. This is in the northern hardwoods. Uh, sugar, uh, American beech is the most shade tolerant, followed by sugar maple. We would put uh, red maple and, and yellow birch in the intermediate group. Uh, white ash is intolerant. And, and the very shade tolerant of black cherry and aspen. So the diamond limit cutting essentially would have removed the bottom tree species and probably the yellow birch as well, leaving behind things like red maple or sugar maple or American beech. Now in the, in the uneven age stands, those mostly have shade tolerant species, and for us that was sugar maple. So the diamond limit cutting would have taken away the bigger sugar maple and left the smaller sugar maple. And remember the characteristic here, in uneven age stands, those smaller sugar maple are younger sugar maple. But for the other characteristics, let's use a series of charts that will have this general configuration. The vertical axis will show some kind of change uh, from bottom to top uh, increase in the, in the magnitude of the change. And then across the bottom, the stands are aligned by virtue of their, their stand rating score. So the very well-managed stands will be on the left, a rating of 1, for example. And the ravaged stands will be on the right, a rating of 3. And then there'll be some kind of a line which will show the, di the direction of the change. Now, in, in all of these cases, we measured the stumps and reconstructed what appeared to be the characteristics of the pre-cut stand. And because of that, we could then compare what we believe was in the pre-cut stand to what we found in the residual stand and, and come up with an estimate of change. And so here, in average stand diameter, uh, foresters call this quadratic stand diameter, or QSD. So the QSD either increases or decreases. Most silviculture treatments will increase the quadratic stand diameter or reduce it only slightly. As an example, if you're doing selection system and take the oldest age class out of an uneven age stand, inevitably you reduce the quadratic stand diameter slightly, but only by a small amount. So here is our finding. Again, remember the good stands are on the left and the ravaged stands are on the right. And you see that the degree of ravaging or, or uh, harshness of cutting uh, increase the the amount of change, and, and in all cases, went from well-managed stands to poorly-managed stands, quadratic 
again, diameter dropped. Even age stands, it would, it would look something like this, removing the biggest trees, left these small ones behind. These are all the same age now, but they're small. There's an example of diameter limit cutting in, on, in an even age stand, taking out the bigger sugar maple, leaving whatever is behind. <clears throat> in uneven age stands, where we have several age classes, diameter rem limit cutting removes the older age classes. Not just one, but the older age classes. Anything that's as large as the threshold diameter. But the ones that leave behind <coughs> will be younger age classes that should have some good genetic potential in them. This is an uneven age stand. That's the effect of a second, a second diameter limit cut in this stand, reducing the quadratic stand diameter. <coughs> That we could look at the change, the potential for change in future growth and production, and here we particularly want to uh, separate out what likely will occur in even age stands versus uneven age stands. So let's start with the even age stands subjected to diameter limit cut. In even age stands, we we separate the trees in the four crown classes, and use that for a lot of, as an index for a lot of our management decisions. The dominant trees are the biggest ones. Their crowns extend above the main canopy layer. They receive sunlight from the top and the sides. These are the trees that have grown best in the past. They're the fastest growing ones. They're the ones with best promise for the future. There is evidence that these are genetically the best for the particular site where they're growing. Co-dominants are also good trees. Far more of these than dominants. Dominants are relatively few. But the co-dominants make up the main canopy layer. They're good trees. They have good form and, and growth. They have good promise for the future. And they're genetically good, acceptable trees. The third class we call intermediates. These are poor. Their crowns extend up into the base of the main canopy layer. They usually grow between cracks of light uh, among the upper canopy trees. They grow poorly. They've grown poorly in the past. They'll grow poorly in the future. These are genetically undesirable. And the overtop trees are just plain wretched. They, they're they hanging on. They, they don't grow well at all. They have a very, the life crown ratio could be 5% on these. They're very weak. They're woeful. But what's the implication? We've, we've looked at the growth of trees in different crown positions following uh, thinning in even age northern hardwood stands. And I'm focusing here on sugar maple. So in the 15-year period after thinning, the dominant trees added about three inches and the co-dominants nearly two inches. That's a good growth response after release. The intermediate trees grew only an inch and a third, and the overtop trees two-thirds of an inch. That's a rather poor response after thinning. So the, the general pattern that comes out of, of growth studies is that the dominants grow best, the co-dominants grow quite well, the intermediates grow poorly, and the overtop trees don't grow well at all. They're terrible. <clears throat> Here's the most recent data we have. And this, again, is, is following uh, e uh, even age northern hardwoods, sugar maple, following thinning. And, and uh, you notice that all of these lines, uh, they're, they're lower on the left-hand side, and they're higher on the right-hand side. And then we've displayed on it the, uh, excuse me, the, the years. This is the time period on, on the left and, and uh, left to right. So each line represents a tree of different diameter. And, and you see that the small trees grow less than the big trees for any period of time. If you leave the small trees, the growth potential is just, is just poor. If you remove the big trees, then you've left behind those trees with poor growth potential. And that's what diameter limit cutting does to our forests. Now contrast this with uneven age stands, where you have different trees of different ages and they're different sizes. You, you note here that, that all of these trees have a relatively large life crown ratio, the proportion of total height in, in live foliage, and that the as you go from big to small, it, it, you, you see a change in diameter, but also in height. Our work with 
growth of sugar maple in uneven age stands shows a distinctly different pattern from what we found with even age ones. You see curves here representing two residual levels of stocking. The vertical axis is the growth of the tree, the annual growth, and the horizontal axis, the tree diameter. <clears throat> and these show that, that the small trees in even age stands have a high growth potential. And notice that a four inch tree uh, in 15 years will add about two inches. Uh, an eight and 12 inch tree about uh, a little under two inches. And the 16 and 20 inch just under two inches. So th they've got reasonable growth potential throughout. And this is in stands cut to 75 square feet of basal area. But the small trees will grow better. The two curves on the left show that if you reduce the stocking in the stand, 75% is or square feet is the green line, 65 square feet is the black line. If you reduce the stocking in the stand, then you increase uh, residual stand tree diameter growth. <clears throat> so the difference is, is important. In even age stands, if you cut the big trees, you've removed the trees with the best growth potential. That's not necessarily the case in uneven age stands. <clears throat> And while diameter limit cutting is not desirable in uneven age stands, the key factor for long-term production, timber anyway, is to, re is to control residual stocking and the spatial distribution of residual trees. Now what about the change in tree quality? <clears throat> we didn't use a, a very high standard here. We, we looked at uh, whether a tree could produce one eight-foot saw timber and what is their, their number that is out there? The, the one eight foot saw timber, eight foot saw log is a minimum for a saleable factory grade saw log, something that would be considered gradable and would bring value to a landowner. <clears throat> we saw. Here's that same diagram. Again, the, the stands with the highest score on the left, uh, that is the best condition. The trees with the poorest condition are on the right. And you notice as we go from the well-managed stands to the poor-managed stands, the proportion of total growing stock and good trees de diminishes. Here's the saw timber growing stock. It's the same pattern. As we go from the good to the poor, we find fewer and fewer and fewer good trees. An example of diameter limit cutting in even age stands, and you, you see the, the rather poor quality stuff that's left by trees of subordinate county positions in even age stands just do not have good quality. And if you take the others away, you're leaving trees of poor quality. Here's the same thing in an unmanaged, uneven age stand. You see they've left trees of poor quality. <clears throat> now what, in, what about the uniformity of residual stocking? And, and I call that patchiness. And then we want to know how that might limit future stand treatments. Same kind of diagram here. And notice that if we go from the well-managed to the poorly managed stands, the degree of patchiness increases. The stands are, the trees are less regularly, less uniformly distributed. <clears throat> With a few exceptions, there, there are some where there have been major in, improvements <coughs> in uniformity. But in most cases, there's some degree of patchiness that's entered into a stand, even with silviculture, because if you're regenerating something, you have to create these voids to, to make space for the new cohort. So here's an example of an even age stand prior to diameter limit cutting. And afterwards, you notice the patchiness that you end up with, as seen here. These big openings intermixed between areas of very tight spacing, intermixed with some individual trees. On even age stands, they start out like this. Now, remember there's a, the sizes associated with ages. You end up with patchiness if you do diameter limit cutting, as you see here. And again, this cluster varies with dense trees and, and places where there's no trees. Fifth criteria was interference. Uh, we didn't actually measure this, but I'm, I'm folding in here some things we've learned by other studies. Interference inter prevents the regeneration of successful species, whether you do it by natural or artificial regeneration. 
In the general rule of thumb we use up here in the Northeast, if interfering plants cover one third or more of the stand area, you have a high risk of regeneration failure. Uh, let me highlight four species that are our most common points of interference, and that is uh, a standard or New York fern, or American beech saplings in the understory. Those will occur before cutting, and you can see them. Striped maple and pin cherry often appear after cutting. Just look at the speech understory. The rule says if we find this on one third or more of the stand area, we, we need to remove it as a site preparation technique before we do anything else. All of those small trees are, are beech in the stand that was heavily cut over in the past. We've, we've learned through our, our cutting trials, our, our demonstrations, that if you remove the beach understory, as you see on the left, we can promote desirable regeneration be, beneath the residual trees. Just taking out that dense beach understory makes a major change in the quality of light in the understory and in the presence of the seed source, the, at least the sugar maple seed will, regerm, will germinate and we get advanced regeneration form. So this would be the first step, getting rid of the inference, getting advanced regeneration started, and then proceeding with management. <clears throat> Ferns and grasses are uh, a major issue, particularly in heavily cut over stands. Uh, remember that in, in ecosystems, if you create a void, it gets filled with something. And if you don't have desirable trees to replace them, that is, you don't have a desirable seed source, something else will fill that void. So following, especially a second diameter limit cutting, we often find the stands with a dense understory of herbaceous plants of one kind or another. Site preparation must remove that before you proceed with anything else. And, and we found that the only effective way to do the site preparation in these cases is with uh, mistle and herbicides. So there's at least five factors that showed up in our evaluations, at least that will uh, influence what we do to plan for rehabilitation. One is the reduction in average stand diameter, the degree of it. The other is the potential for future growth, whether the trees left behind have a growth potential or not, the change in residual tree quality, and if it's there, the patchiness, and the likelihood of interference, either is present or will likely spread throughout the stand. And note this, the good stands differ appreciably from the mediocre stands, and they differ appreciably from the poor stands. So rehabilitation really applies to mediocre and poor stands, and regular silviculture works with the good stands. I judge that among the different things we've seen in cutover stands, that patchiness complicates prescription making. It results from not only having an irregular distribution of residual trees, but also having an irregular stocking of ones that are usable, at least for timber production purposes. So we're faced with low stocking, and we're faced with irregular stocking, and we're faced with irregular stocking of good trees. But, but these are all confounded by the high degree of variability that we find from one cutover stand to the another. And, and you can see that in these diagrams that, that the spread of points around the trend lines can be quite broad. So, so that there's no ubiquitous treatment we can prescribe. This will, be, this will require a detailed inventory before you start a prescription. It will mean assessing the nature of the growing stock and then coming up with a, a, a strategy for each stand. In some cases, a single treatment might work, particularly if we can go to a low density stocking, as you see in the upper right, uh, the center or the, the lower right. In other cases, uh, we may have such poor growing stock that we can remove the whole stand, clear cut it, and start again. I, I think from with most cutover stands, though, you have this patchiness, which means that there is no one single treatment that might work there unless you can remove all of the trees. And, and there is often some growing stock left behind that you could use to enhance the future or that will maintain some kind of a non-market value that's important to a landowner. 
So many of us talking about these things have come to realize that these cutover stands will require a prescription that integrates multiple treatments within the same stand. Here you see an example from Laura Kennefick's work in Maine where there's some crop tree release, there's a tending of some residual conifers, and there's planting of spruce in, in the open spaces. Remember the cutover stands have only a few good trees and often wide spacing. And that's what requires the heavy cutting to get rid of those dregs, leave the growing stock in a good condition, and trigger a new cohort to grow into the future. <clears throat> so perhaps what we end up doing, based on the inventory we get, is to partially cut some parts of the stand to, to establish a new age class and grow the residual trees into the future, at least the good ones. That would trigger a two age arrangement so we would get a new cohort started underneath those residual trees and it would grow up and we tend it as 2 age into the future. Parts of the stand. Other parts of the stand have nothing worth talking about for the future and so we would clear them all off. Clear cut patches and use natural regeneration to replace the old. Now, uh, this is a good option if, if you have advanced regeneration of desirable species. In many of the forest community types we have in Eastern North America, and in the West as well, the key to reducing the risk of failure in clear cutting is to have well-developed, advanced regeneration well distributed across the site. And if you have that, clear cutting will succeed. You want to have advanced regeneration like I'm showing here on the screen. This is sugar maple beneath a, an even age sugar maple stand. It needs to be abundant and well distributed. And if you have that, and you take the overwood off in one cut, you will, you'll get something like this. In other parts of the stand, natural regeneration has already formed beneath the poor quality residual trees, and we could do a uh, an overstory, a release cutting in, the, in this case, taking away those those older junk trees, releasing the understory for growth and development. There will be some places with patches of good trees that just didn't have anything merchantable in them, and we go in and apply traditional tending there to reduce the, the stocking to the best trees in uniformly distributed spacing to a proper residual density. Uh, but commonly will be the low density be, because there are often relatively few good trees, even in these fairly dense patches. This is a stand, for example, that's been reduced to 45% relative density. In uneven age stands, it will, it will mean cutting to low residual density. Uh, like the example you see here, cut to about 55 or 60 square feet to the acre. And in the process, trying to balance the age classes, trying to maintain this intermixing of age classes in proper proportions. At those low densities, we will generally find a cohort will develop beneath the openings, given no interference, given no herbivory, and then we can move into the future with a more traditional uneven age silviculture. Parts of the stand, maybe important parts of the stand, just have no redeeming social value. And, and so we we'll just have to take all of the junk trees off there. That'll, we don't have advanced regeneration in many of those cases. We have interference. We have to clean out the interference. And the only option we'll have then is to uh, plant them. And probably with a conifer species, because of the difficulty of planting. And it'll transform these wretched old areas with uh, degraded hardwoods into a, essentially a plantation. Jean-Martin Lucier up in, uh, in Canada working with the uh, Canadian Forest Service, uh, he and uh, uh, Daniel Pinn and some others have been looking at how they might apply these kinds of treatments at a at a commercial scale using mechanized harvesting. And as they've evaluated stands left behind by diamond limit cutting, they find that, too, that there's often these multiple treatments required. Here's an example. In parts of the stand, they may have an option of a low density thinning, where the eggs means acceptable growing stock. You, you won't need any regeneration here. Uh, in other places, they will completely remove whatever is in the overstory because there's 
Oh, it's unacceptable growing stock. <clears throat> and it might release accept, uh, acceptable advanced regeneration. That's the key. They will have acceptable regeneration here. Where they don't have it, they'll try a shelterwood-like practice in this small area to establishing that missing, missing advanced regeneration. And in parts of the stands that are uneven aged, uh, they may use a selection system cutting. Uh, what, what you put into these options depends upon your pre-cut evaluation and the alternatives that you can identify from that. So they would use an approach much like this. The, they establish these uh, trails for the taller buncher. And uh, the yellow or the orange and green circles represent trees of different sizes. They would go through and uh, on the first line at the left, they would apply treatment number one and then one. They, they set this up so the operator has a set of decision criteria and makes a decision based upon what that operator can reach with the arm of the feller buncher as they're parked. So they start off, look at the circle, apply treatment within reach of the feller buncher arm, then move up to the next place, make a decision, apply that treatment. And so they're going up the trail, stopping each time, making a judgment, and applying the treatment, and they'll come back on another trail. And, and you see that when they finish here, they will, they will be ending up with something that is diverse in its residual conditions. In some places, it's been partially cut. In some places, it will be little even-aged patches. In some places, it will be uneven-aged. It, it'll be what, we, what I want to call an any-aged condition of mixed quality but improved because of the treatment that they've given. So they've gone from this condition, which has this mixture of poor, good, and bad, to this condition, which, which involves this multi-treatment approach. You see in right of center is a little patch cut. In other places, there's partial cuts. But what other alternative do we have, given the patchiness, given the lack of good growing stock, given the way the stand has been treated in the past, that we cannot expect to end up with uniform conditions throughout, but rather as a rehabilitation treatment, beginning to upgrade the stand in a way that we can move into the future with a more promising outlook. It's going to require a well-planned civil culture based on a valid inventory, and we'll, we'll apply our techniques in new and creative ways. It will mean reviving the vitality of forest through these methods. It will reestablish appropriate biologic diversity. It will reduce the spread of invasive plants. It will reverse the ecologic chaos. And it will reclaim the capacity for wood production. In a sense, gaining control, not subduing, but gaining influence over the way forest stands grow and develop into the future, based on a multi-treatment strategy for cut over stands. And that's what's new. And that's what's new. So the real need to overcome the bothersome past, to consider a new multi-treatment approach, and to rehabilitate the chaos in a controlled and deliberate manner. A multi-treatment of civil culture from the bag of many tricks. That's what we see for the future. So Tom, I guess uh, I'd be glad to entertain uh, comments and questions. Uh, were there some? Yes. Um, and I have to apologize, I can't stay very much longer, about another seven or eight minutes, but uh, one of the questions from uh, Jake Meyer would have to refer back to a specific graph, so I'm going to have to pass on that. But Jake had a second question. Complete removal if quality is bad question. Is that, uh, shouldn't we, should we not leave some unacceptable growing stock for structure in the stand for wildlife consideration? Recall that back at the start, I, I argued that rehabilitation must address the objectives of ownership. And if structure is important, then yes, leave some structure. Uh, in, in some cases, uh, you may have uh, no other option for seed source, and then you would leave some of those trees, even though they're not desirable uh, in, in the phenotypic sense. So, respond to the objectives of ownership. That's the first thing you have to ascertain in making any civil culture prescription and then gear up your treatments to be sure that you've satisfied those. We do have some time for some more questions if others want to type them into the box. Um, Ralph, given the importance of a good stand evaluation and the multi-treatment strategy that you've described, 
I wouldn't want to eliminate anybody from, you know, working on their own stands, but how important is it to get a professional involved, some a trained forester? <clears throat> I've always felt that uh, that's that's important. Uh, allegedly, people who come out of our forestry programs understand something about ecosystems, and they understand about trees and how they grow, and they understand how we can change the patterns of growth and development. But I must say that that not all foresters are equal. And so the key is to find not just a forester, but someone who has the experience and who has a demonstrated ability to practice civil culture in a fairly sophisticated way. And, and that, that will be the challenge of landowners, to find those people who, in fact, can do this job. Would you say that the challenges and the impacts of diameter limit cutting, for example, are greater with an even age stand, and also the the forty nine percent of stands that were in a mixed condition. How many? How much of that do you think was even aged? Uh, let me deal with the second part first. We we've done some crude estimates and, and believe probably that uh, due to the due to the re natural forestation of former agriculture sites, probably in the order of seventy five percent of the forest area in New York State is even aged, particularly outside the, the forest preserves of the Adirondack Mountains. So uh, we have a, we probably were sampling mostly even aged stands, <clears throat> although there were uneven aged ones in there. Uh, by far, these, these cuttings are most devastating in even aged stands for the reasons I tried to articulate. The, the small trees in even aged stands are runs. Once a run, always a run. My, my colleague says this, if, if I were to cut the big trees out of an even age stand, it would be like going to a horse race, shooting the winners, and putting the losers out the stud. Now, I, I think that's, that sort of sums it up. When you cut the big trees out of these even age stands, you're, you're destroying the future. In uneven age stands, there are small trees that are younger that should have reasonable genetic potential for growth and development. So by far, this is most devastating in even-aged stands. Um, Brett has a question. What types of stands do deer leave alone? <laughs> the deer leave stands alone as there's no undergrowth in them. <laughs> uh, deer, deer certainly are a problem. And, and uh, we, we found through the experience, uh, particularly in the north part of uh, on our Huntington Wildlife Forest, that the only way to effectively deal with deer is by hunting and, and to hunt the antlerless deer. And there's evidence that uh, if you start a hunting program and carry it on for a few years, uh, you can reduce the density of the herd at a place to a level where the deer density is more in balance with the capacity of the forest to produce food. And at that point, you will have reduced problems in regenerating forest trees. Uh, this can be done as over in areas of as little as 250, 300 acres probably. But, but the only way to deal with the deer is to hunt them and to hunt the antlerless deer. You must reduce the females of the population. Nora has a good question. In an uneven age stand, is there an advantage to culling the overtopped non-performers along the way? The basic idea of, of tending in the even age, uneven age stands, you've taken out the mature one, and in each of the immature age classes, you are, you are keeping the best and cutting the others to a, to a residual number. So if you are periodically entering an uneven age stand, and each time you're, you're favoring the best of the cohort, you end up with great trees at the end by the time you reach maturity. So in a sense, you're when you when you take out the poor of a cohort, you're favoring the best in that cohort, and you're also enhancing the growth conditions for ones in the younger cohorts. I'm not sure if that speaks to Nora's question. Yeah, I think so. I think that that it did address it, and the answer would be yes. That uh, you'd be calling the overtopped non-performers along the way. But but in you know in a in a prescription that. Uh, reduces that stand to a balanced condition. So you, you, you want to practice selection system as we know how to do it, not just cut bad trees from the stand. Mm, true. 
So you have, you have, you're looking for the residual density and the diameter distribution with the diameter distribution being a surrogate for the age class distribution. And your, your goal is to, to work towards having equivalent amount of growing space in each age class. I think we've just about reached the end. Oh, I do see a, a good uh, question from Toby Alexander. When working in high-graded stands, do you have approaches to determine site index? productivity for the stand when all you have left in the stand is what the suppressed or intermediate stems uh, were there prior to high grading. With these inferior shorter trees left behind, the stand may seem less worthy of investment for rehab and overlooked. Do you rely on soil maps, uh, site indicator plants, regeneration, remaining species, height of residuals? How do you assess the uh, productivity of the stand when it's been treated like this? There really is no effective way that I've seen to to evaluate productivity in our in our uh, high latitude hardwood forests, simply because every tree in there has been affected by ice and snow damage or wind breakage, and the cardinal rule of site index is that you must use trees of upper canopy positions, never impeded in their growth by disturbance or something. So it. Site index, by definition, does not apply to uneven age stands because the ochre cohorts have grown in the shade of others. And in even age stands, where the tops have been broken out, you can't find a qualifier. So the test we made a site index uh, in northern hardwoods, you come up with an average of 65 plus or minus 10, and that's the whole range of site classes people have defined. I don't. We just need to find a better way. The, the folks uh, in parts of New England and in eastern Canada and other places rely on soils maps to give them general ideas, but uh, we, we really do not have an effective way to judge site quality uh, using a, a site index. That's about all I can say. Well, Dr. Allen, I sure appreciate your presentation. Um, we're going to call it good for today. and. Uh, it will be available for uh, replay from the same site. Is there anything that uh, you wanted to add, Holly or Eddie? Uh, I would just say thanks, everybody, for attending. And, Tom, what would have been a small teleconference turned into an event for about 160 people. And we welcome their participation and welcome them back for another webinar of their choice. So come back and visit us again, and we appreciate it.